the Reverend Dr. David N. Moore, Jr. Oh. And uh, what's your name? <laughs> Jared Moore, my dear son.
God breathed on Sojourner Truth, a preacher, abolitionist, activist for the women's right to vote, and a former slave. She delivered a powerful speech at a women's rights convention, a gathering of fewer than 300 people in Akron, Ohio in 1851, showing us that it's not the size of the crowd that changes history. Let me read an excerpt from Sojourner's address. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? Yes. I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Yes. And then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. <laughs> Obliged to you for hearing me, and now old sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. I would like to respectfully disagree, Sojourner Truth, you have a lot more to say. Mm. Thank you all for being here at the Marjorie Luke Theater for Visions of Hope's 10th anniversary celebration. Can we give them a hand right now? <laughs> and to the dear Pipersburg family, I am grateful to you for inviting me to talk about this extremely important subject, and I think I can help in two ways. First, I want to show that there are forces that are trying to take away the power of the vote, not only from African Americans, but from most people, Democrat, Republican, anybody else. These forces have been at work from the beginning of our republic. The vote was restricted to white male landowners, and founder James Madison feared that the country would become an oligarchy. Madison was concerned that we would be a country run of, by, and for the rich. And of course, being a slaveholder himself, he didn't really believe in democracy. <coughs> the second thing that I'd like to do is to shed light on how we will overcome how we will create a just society, something we all desire. And I will understand if some of you here become angered, disappointed, even shocked by some of the things you'll hear me reveal this afternoon. Shocked because it may represent an alternate reality. There's a very dear woman in our church here in Santa Barbara who I like to call on to speak from time to time and people love hearing from her. Last fall, and this woman is white, I approached her to ask her to speak again, and she was reluctant. She said that she had noticed how her presentation of an earlier date was too white-centered. My reply was that I often feel that I am white-centered. I owe this largely to my public school education. School in America, well, we learned about Henry Ford, but nothing of Henry Cecil McBay. Mm. Where we learned to square dance, but never even heard of a ring shot. Okay. 
Where we learned about the Marshall Plan, but nothing about Thurgood Marshall. That's right. Where we learned to perform John Philip Sousa, but never John Coltrane. And I want to give a shout out to all of the historically black colleges and universities struggling financially, but still holding it down. Yeah. Yes. I wish, I wish I had learned about Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges and I, if we can show her, she and I are the same age. When I started kindergarten, I did not need protection from the National Guard like Ruby did. But just like Ruby Bridges, I integrated my school in San Francisco in 1959. My parents did not anticipate that I would be treated so harshly by some teachers and students so far from their home in the Jim Crow South. Unlike Ruby Bridges, I did not have a supportive black community around me like the NAACP or Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I was the only African American in my school until my sister Bobby started kindergarten. There should be a picture of me right there. From early childhood, I found myself excelling as a good student with a faulty curriculum. All the way from kindergarten and into college, Teachers had little or nothing to say about A. Philip Randolph, Shirley Chisholm, or Malcolm X. Knowledge of blackness was contraband. We did not learn about Jim Crow and how hard our country was fighting to keep us down. We did not learn about the prolonged violent campaign to keep my people from voting. In the year 2012, KEYT reporter Tracy Lair showed up on my parents' doorstep in Oxnard, and here's why. For some 30 years, mom and dad had received their ballots by mail, but that year, only dad received one. He made the requisite phone calls to inquire, but got nowhere. I saw how much this bothered him, so I contact, contacted Key News. That's when I began to truly appreciate how valuable the vote was to my parents. We never did find out why the ballot didn't come. It was later reported that there were others who were also purged. We found out that heads rolled at the Ventura County Clerk and Recorder's Office, but the public was not made aware of any more details of the investigation. Back when my parents were born in North Carolina, one third of the state's population was black. But the state had no black congresspersons, no black governors, no black mayors, no black police chiefs or sheriffs. Think about that. One in three of the taxpayers in the state were black, but underrepresented. You and I both know that a million black folks did not vote only for white folks to represent them. The problem was voter suppression. One of the ways North Carolina, like other southern states, stopped African Americans from having any political voice was the white primary. The South was a one-party system if you wanted to vote, you had to be a Democrat. The Democratic Party and later Dixiecrats did all they could to intimidate and inconvenience African Americans, and the federal government refused to intervene. And it makes you wonder why in the world so many African Americans are Democrats today. It was the result of Nixon's and later Reagan's Southern strategy, which capitalized on President Lyndon Baines Johnson's signing of the Civil Rights Act and a year later, the Voting Rights Act. President Johnson was a Democrat and a son of the South. Southerners saw him as a traitor to their Southern values. The former Confederate states turned against LBJ's administration 
And in a television interview with Bill Moyers, the president said, I think we've just delivered the South to the Republican Party for a long time to come. Before that, African Americans despised the Democratic Party so much that in 1966, when they had a chance to finally elect a sheriff, Wilson Baker, to replace Selma's hateful and brutal Jim Clark, black power leader Stokely Carmichael said, we'd rather see Jim Clark elected than Wilson Baker, because Baker would give the Democratic Party a respectability it doesn't deserve. To ask Negroes to get in the Democratic Party is like asking Jews to join the Nazi Party. And the South did have poll taxes. Even worse, polling places across the South were often staffed by sheriffs. The black community was well aware of the blowback that could come their way when they tried to vote. Here in the 21st century, North Carolina still grapples with voter suppression. Three years ago, North Carolina legislators launched a meticulous and coordinated effort to deter black voters. And last year, the GOP admitted in court that it was intended to thwart the black vote. Just before the 2016 election in North Carolina, 158 polling places were permanently closed in 40 counties with the most African American voters, leading to a 16% decline in African American voting in that state. An MIT study found that nationwide Hispanic voters wait 150% longer in line than white voters and black voters can expect to wait 200% longer. But North Carolina is just one of many states where people have been deprived of the ballot. In Florida, the year 2000, candidate George Bush's brother, Governor Jeb Bush, and Jeb's Secretary of State, Katherine Harris, tossed somewhere between 20,000 and 90,000 African-American voters off the rolls, thus leading to Bush becoming president. More recently, in Ohio, between the 2012 and 2016 presidential elections, the state purged more than 2 million voters from its rolls, the vast majority in heavily African-American and Hispanic counties. Virginia purged 41,637 voters. Indiana purged 481,235 voters. Georgia purged 591,549 voters. Republican secretaries of state across the nation are right now removing voters from the rolls. Over 17 million, more than 10% of America's active voters in just the period between 2016 and 2018, according to NBC News. In 2018, investigative reporter Greg Pallas sued a number of Republican secretaries of state and got his hands on purge lists that included more than 90,000 people in largely Democratic parts of Nevada, 769,000 voters purged in Colorado, 340,000 more in Georgia, half a million in Illinois, plus a large but as yet uncounted list from Nebraska, 469,000 purged in Indiana. This past December, in Wisconsin, a few days after news broke that a conservative group is forcing the state to purge upwards of 230,000 people from state voter rolls, an audio recording of a private event was leaked with the voice of one of President Trump's top re-election advisors telling influential Republicans in swing state Wisconsin that their party has traditionally relied on voter suppression to compete in battleground states. But listen, the Republican Party does not want to stop African Americans from voting. They want to stop as many of us as possible. They just know that they have gotten away with it in African American communities and among Latinos. If the rest 
of the poor and middle class Americans were treated the way that we have been treated, they would revolt. In his book titled The Hidden History of the War on Voting, released just two weeks ago, author Tom Hartman asserts, today's right-left battle was seated in 1971 when Lewis Powell, the year before Richard Nixon put him on the Supreme Court, wrote his infamous memo to the United States Chamber of Commerce imploring the very wealthy and big business to get politically active. He explicitly called for a vigorous effort to take over the court system of America, which he believed was being used way too often against business and the rich by environmentalists and consumer activists like Rachel Car Carlson and Ralph Nader. Well, Justice Powell knew that the nine justices had become essentially the new kings and queens of America with the power to second guess and thus strike down laws passed by Congress and signed by the President. The same powers that want to stop your vote also want to stop funding of hospitals and public schools. They want to repeal Social Security, minimum wage laws. They want to terminate Medicare and Medicaid. They want to bring an end to unions. They want to end the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration. They want to shut down the Postal Service and they want you to pay student loans for the rest of your life. Well, can somebody say well? well. Can you say you had church if nobody has said well yet? Well. And since I am a preacher, and this is a time of, of worship, before I close, I better preach. But, but first, let me point out, I have been wonderfully influenced by my Native American brothers and sisters toward an appreciation of ancestors. And this afternoon, we are remembering our ancestors. We are reclaiming our rightful past. We are reaching back to capture the courage, the hope, the ingenuity, the shed blood, the agony of forced separation, the rapes, the humiliation of our forefathers and our foremothers. We may or may not have met these people, but we're, we are reaching back to get what they deserve and always wanted us to inherit. That's right. We have decided to honor their legacy by bringing them out of hiding. Whether we knew them or not, God gave us our ancestors, and although they were mistreated, we are going to treat them right. That's right. Black history is about us returning to our ancestors, lest our, free, our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. When we recognize our ancestors, it is subversive because we were all assigned white ancestors and white supporting ancestors and a few sanitized stories of black ancestors. For ancestors, we were handed white presidents, white generals, white novelists, white poets, white athletes, white inventors, white academics, white musicians, and white clergy. But we're looking at our ancestors' legacy beyond the bloodbath and deprivation which was our ancestors' experience. And we're looking all over this country, especially throughout the South, and what happens, what happened to them, particularly around election time. They faced the Ku Klux Klan, America's preeminent domestic terrorist group, who sustained an aggressive program of lynching, robbery, rape, and terror. An unknown quantity of African Americans were tortured and killed or had their houses and churches burned down simply for trying to vote or trying to register others. Terrorists. But we made it through. Yeah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate the rising recognition of Christ in the world. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, but he desires to anoint all of us. That's what the word Christ means. It means anointed. Christ is wonderful and compelling. And because the mystery that we call God 
will not be chained down to a name or a gender or a nationality or a religion. We can all know what it's like to be anointed. And for many, the term Christ is more inclusive. But there are still a lot of us who embrace Christ, but we love the name of Jesus. Okay. Which on the surface may seem too exclusive. But in the black church, you won't hear the term Christ as nearly as you will hear the word Jesus. This is because Jesus, the human, was one of us. He did nothing to deserve it, but Jesus was beaten, tortured, and lynched. Jesus gets us, and we get Jesus. This is why we love to sing, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. It's why we sing, there is power in the name of Jesus. Furthermore, in the black church, we still talk about the blood. We sing about the blood of Jesus. We preach about the blood of Jesus. In fact, right now, I plead the blood of Jesus. The reason that we are so drawn to the blood is because his blood is mingled with our grandparents' blood and mixed with the infected blood we heard about this past Monday of innocent children in Flint, Michigan, sick because their parents are too scared to bathe in lead-infected water and they use baby wipes instead. The blood of Jesus. Somebody say it. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is mixed with our community's diabetic blood. It's mixed with sickle cell anemic blood. It's mixed with the blood of our young people, of whom many have concluded that the only logical response to oppression and despair is violence. And so our own children's blood flows in the streets. And the blood of Jesus is mixed with the blood of Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Renisha McBride, and Stephon Clark. This is why we feel there is something about the name Jesus. Still here in 2020, we desperately need to identify and experience the anointing. It's too precious to brush aside. We need to look for the anointing to observe Christ. I began today by saying that our community's ancestor, Sojourner Truth, still speaks. Sojourner Truth brought so much grace to America. And I suggest that if we want to locate today's anointing, we start by looking among African American women. There we will find the grace that can help all of us. Alongside indigenous women, black women hold in trust the grace that we need. In our society's pitch black moral midnight, black women are our North Star. Women who, come on somebody, who support our neighbors with physical disabilities. Black women who support Black womanhood cares about the 2.3 million people in American prisons, plus 450,000 innocent Americans currently in jail simply because they're too poor to cover bail. You may be asking me, how do you know they're innocent? It's because this is America. And in America, you are innocent until proven guilty. 
shit 